we need to remove the middle leg and the middle man because we continue to be at the mercy of others. The words of the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, on the issue of vaccine inequity while speaking exclusively to SABC News after delivering an impassioned speech during the general debate of the United Nations General Assembly days earlier. Motley, who became the first female head of government in her country after a landslide win in 2018, covers a range of issues with the SABC correspondent Sherwin Bryce Pease from COVID-19, climate change and the transition of Barbados to a republic before the year's end. Let's bring you that right now. Mia Motley, welcome to SABC News. Thank you. Your speech to the United Nations General Assembly has been described as follows. Impassioned, one of the most compelling statements delivered at UNGA. The speech of High Level Week. Rousing, inspired, a must-see, and the list goes on. What stood out for us, Prime Minister, was your frustration at a process and international system, a United Nations, that seems incapable of meeting the most pressing challenges of our time. Tell us what was going through your mind at that time and what the intention of the speech was. Well, I think that the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, is truly trying his best and that we have set out um, for us in the speech that he gave six clear divisions that need to be bridged. What is obviously lacking is the political will that is necessary for us to see progress within the multilateral system. And ironically, in 2018, when I first addressed the United Nations as Prime Minister of Barbados, I spoke about how similar the moment was to what the world looked like 100 years before. But the difference that we had is that we had a framework in the context of the United Nations and the other um, Bretton Woods institutions, the WHO. We didn't even know about the pandemic then, of course, um, that could play that defining role. What we've now seen, especially against the backdrop of the pandemic, is an absence of global leadership politically that has allowed the world to take the hard and make the hard decisions to be able to avert the worst that we can see with the pandemic, to be able to literally protect us from the worst that we will see as small island developing states and as countries between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn for the climate crisis that does not yet allow us to treat to the real issues of debt and the financing gaps that have occurred as a result of the economic recession that has come from the pandemic. So we have a number of issues <coughs> that have literally mushroomed but what we're not yet seeing is the kind of global cooperation and partnership in spite of the fact that the architecture is technically there. We don't need new architecture. We may need to repurpose aspects of it because when the United Nations was formed, it was formed with a specific purpose and it was formed against the backdrop of 50 countries. Most of us that exist now did not exist at that time in 1945. Similarly with the IMF and the World Bank, similarly with other institutions. So I really do believe that the time has come for us to determine whether what we have is appropriate for purpose. And quite frankly, the kind of political, um, and I'm gonna use a different word, a word that is very colloquial in our part of the world, the kind of political backative that the Secretary General and the United Nations needs in order to be able to deliver for the majority of countries in the world is simply regrettably not there in the way that it should be. Let's focus, Prime Minister, just for a moment on the UN system that is emblematic, I think, of multilateral systems around the world. The consensus-driven approach is one of frustration more often than not and paints the UN, particularly organs like the Security Council, as a failure, a intergovernmental uh, negotiation process on reform that makes zero progress here in and here out. So what must be done, Prime Minister, and what are the consequences of failure for what you have described as a dangerous moment facing the world? Well, I think that we've all talked about reform of the Security Council for some time now, but we know that we have the P5, the Permanent 5. And the reality is, that is that the same world that we have today, that when that was formed? And, and to get the reform requires not the decision of the technocrats of the UN, it requires the decision of the political administrations of the world. And, and unless we get to that point, we're going to continue to see more of more. Regrettably, the consequences 
for us not having the kind of action with the pandemic were more immediate. And we see it now because what we really have is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And in our part of the world, for example, the majority of people who are losing their lives are in fact those who are unvaccinated. In Africa, the numbers who are vaccinated are simply way too low. So we felt from the very beginning that there should have been an international clearing house for vaccines that would have allowed for a more equitable distribution because we know we are in a race against the mutations and the variants. And you in South Africa knew that from very early on. Yeah, let's address one of the most pressing uh, issues which you've just raised, uh, Prime Minister, vaccine inequity amidst a pandemic that is raging and killing by the day. You ask how many more deaths must it take before advanced countries share vaccines to address the inequities we are witnessing? What are some of the broader lessons, right? There's a sense certainly in the developing world, in Africa in particular, in the Caribbean, no doubt, uh, that there's a sense of deja vu, you know, that, that emanates from this entire process, the north-south divide, the black-white divide. Speak to what this uh, moment teaches us. Well, I think that was very, very clear from early on. Um, we're in a lot better position now than we were six months ago, eight months ago. And regrettably, part of the difficulty is that most countries in the world simply did not have the capacity to be heard by the pharmaceutical companies. And in dealing and waiting for COVAX, COVAX was obviously going to be the last class with respect to when people would have access to vaccines. And that is the frustration I think that we feel. At the same time, you had all manner of persons offering to sell as middlemen. And that's why in the CARICOM AU summit, you hear me talk about, we need to remove the middle passage, the middle leg and the middle man, because we continue to be at the mercy of others and, and, and we also do so in circumstances where we are not price setters, but we are effectively price takers. Now, we've been lucky in a sense that we thought, only to find out that it hasn't really delivered yet in the way that you would have liked in Africa, nor we would have liked in CARICOM. But luckily, the cooperation between CARICOM and the Africa Union, and I want to thank your president, President Ramahoso, who was chair of the AU at the time. I was chair of the Caribbean community at the time. We were able, therefore, to bring the Caribbean community onto the Africa Medical Supplies platform, which also then extended to the vaccine platform. The truth is, that we have not seen the pace that we would have liked to have seen and that is largely because we have not been at the front line of the distribution of vaccines. And that's why I say if we had an international clearing house, there would, I believe, have been far greater equity and transparency than we have seen. And, and, and we ask ourselves, how can we believe that this is a process that is commendable when in truth and in fact, look at how many variants we've now had. Prime Minister, you asked the General Assembly, and I quote, how much more fake news will be allowed to spread without states defending the public digital space? How do states defend the public di digital space in this era uh, of rife misinformation in what is essentially a life and death scenario? What can the state really do? Yeah, I think that we've already seen the extent to which we've seen um, the social media platforms and the large tech companies um, act together to ensure that, as they've said, two-thirds of the, of the fake news was being generated by no more than 12 people. What I was speaking about goes broader than just vaccinations, and it's really just about being holding people accountable. I don't need to know who you are on the face of it. But if you have defamed someone, or if you are a threat to national security, then we do need to have access to you and to know who is accountable for what they are saying. And it's no different from what happens in our states. We have the right to free speech so long as we don't defame others. It's the same in South Africa, it's the same in most Commonwealth Caribbean countries and Commonwealth countries, period. So it's a case of being able to allow people to know that you cannot act in a way that is going to lead to anarchy and you cannot act with impunity that you have to be accountable for what you say by all means defend it and we don't want to censor anybody but we want people to be accountable for what they say Prime Minister another line that got people's attention in your address here in New York was 
uh, this. If we can find the will to send people to the moon and solve male baldness, we can solve the simple problems of letting our people eat at affordable prices. I'll tell you what, among journalists at the United Nations, we all sat up when you said that. You also talked about the market capitalization of $9.3 trillion for the top tech, uh, five tech firms around the world, while so few have access to data and knowledge that deprive children from the tools needed to participate in online education. You call this a fork in the road moment. What is the, I mean, from where you're sitting, do we solve this in the short term? It doesn't seem so. This is not easy, but it is not incapable of resolution. And, and let's be straight. One of the worst aspects of the consequences of COVID has been the impact that it has had on our children globally. There are so many children who have been left out of school and who don't have access to online learning, either because there's not the electricity or there's not access to the tablet or there's not access to the content on the tablet that is needed. I genuinely believe that at this point in time that we need to bring together the tech companies, the governments and aspects of the private, other wider private sector and civil society to see how we can ensure that every child has access to an affordable tablet. I'm not asking for a free tablet, but I'm asking for a tablet that is built and that is sold at no more than 40, 50 US dollars, that is not determined to become obsolescent because the software can no longer work on it after a year or two, that we need to be able to give it a lifespan of three, four years, because if not, governments are not going to be able to help finance those people who cannot afford to purchase it themselves. In our own country, we have a textbook loan scheme, which needs to be modified to a tablet loan scheme. But imagine if I had to replace every tablet every year or two we wouldn't be able to sustain that so we're saying that look let us look at the global scale and let us make sure that we can build a tablet that is rugged because children will spill drinks on it they'll drop it they'll do all and they'll lose it they'll forget it so we need to have something that is affordable accessible rugged and that makes a difference in our children's lives the worst thing we can do is to leave our children on the side of the road not being able to access the learning and also the social and emotional learning targets that they need because the worst thing is to have a bright child with little or no opportunity. Prime Minister, you call it the fork in the road moment. I call it a Humpty Dumpty moment. And, another, and I'm just not sure if the egg is still on the wall or if, or if it's too late already. Uh, we face another Humpty Dumpty moment on climate change, right? As countries head to the Glasgow uh, uh, conference for the latest UN climate summit, where ambition is the key peg uh, get in getting us towards the 1.5 degree goal. And as countries push for this full annual capitalization of the $100 billion Green Fund for Adaptation, you say this is not going to be enough. There's a growing sense, Prime Minister, that Glasgow might fail like so many UN conferences before it. Uh, what's your sense? We pray that it will not. We really pray that it will not. We cannot allow Glasgow to fail. We may say that it has not been sufficiently ambitious in certain parts or that we need to hold and find ways of holding people to action because ambition without action is like faith without works and we simply cannot um, have that at all. You hear me talk all the time about the small island developing states and why? We say that we need 1.5 degrees to survive. We're already at the point of 1.2. Sky Television runs this dashboard which we've captured the imagination of many in my country which shows that in 12 to 13 years time we will be at that 1.5. What the IPCC report in its call for a um, code red for humanity shows us is that left um, without further interference and changes we will reach 2.7 degrees by the end of the century. Now that, that is unimaginable because it will lead to failed states, it will lead to failed civilizations, it will lead to climate migration. And that is the last thing that we want. And, and we've said simply, look, let us pause and try to get this right. Because the parts of the world that oh, we come from, there are 43 small island developing states in the Alliance of Small Island Developing States. That's almost a fifth of the world's um, nation states. We are telling you that this thing is already playing and wreaking havoc in our own states. But unless we see greater ambition and action, because ambition without action, as I said, is, like, is as much of a problem. We are going to have real issues. We've changed the debate to the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Why? 
because we recognize that our voices alone are not being heard and we need to remind the rest of the world you're in New York City when last did you hear New York being subject to the kinds of hurricanes and the kinds of deaths that you've seen recently as a small child um, in 1976 I lived in New York and I saw Hurricane Bell but since then what really happened so we are now seeing the climate crisis hit home where it hurts in the advanced countries and we're saying simply to them don't only think of yourself because if you're only thinking of yourself you're going to preside over failed states failed civilizations and climate migration over the course of this century and none of us want that Prime Minister you also talked about introducing Glasgow a must succeed right uh, you talked also about introducing a resolution at the UN to endorse the approach of the UN Secretary General who warned that the world was on the edge of the abyss when he presented that common agenda report to the GA. What could a General Assembly resolution really achieve given the fact that these resolutions are not legally binding as for example a resolution out of the Security Council? A reckoning to unlock the populations of the world, the people of the world. You need to know where your government stands on this. And you need to play a role in getting governments that don't support the common agenda to try and come forward and support it. But the first thing we need is a reckoning. We say that democracy is effectively a numbers game. And you have different routes to that numbers game, but whatever all is said and done, it is always the larger number that wins whether there's a two-thirds majority or a simple majority or whatever as an underpinning rule. We are saying that, look, our Secretary General has set out an agenda that is not just a normal discussion, but it is happening at the very time when the world is facing a number of serious threats that will put people's lives at risk and put nation states in peril. And to that extent, if we are serious about resolving the issues, let me know who will stand up and be counted, who is for and who is against. The world can't, and the UN can't force you to be for, but your populations can make and take the position that, hey, this is not what I want to see. And, and as the president of Costa Rica said so eloquently, how many people are in the room under the age of 30 years old? Because these are the people who are going to be affected by the climate crisis. These are the people who are going to be affected by the other one that I didn't speak to, which is the antimicrobial resistance um, issue, and I chair that with the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, the One Health Global Initiative. Why? Because that is the real, real slow motion pandemic that is going to follow this pandemic. And what is it? That we have literally abused antibiotics, not only as human beings, but in terms of what we give our livestock, what we put on plants, and what runs off into the environment. And we are already seeing over seven, 800,000 people a year die from the fact that they can't fight off these super viruses that, 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 that attack them. If we don't see the money going into the research and we don't change our behavior in terms of how we, 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 we give medicine and how we, we um, treat our livestock and plants, we're going to reverse a century of medical progress and a visit to the dentist or having a baby will now become serious acts that put you in peril because of the risk of infection that cannot be fought by the medication that we have. So I'm just throwing a few things out there to show you that the children of this world are the ones who we are fighting for because they are the ones who are going to be affected negatively if we don't solve these problems and in a hurry and regrettably time is not on our side on too many of them. So essentially this would be a resolution about accountability, about reckoning and, 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 and for member states to show us or show you what they are for and what they're against, right? And more importantly, to give the Secretary General and the other institutions that we have created in the multilateral sphere the sense that they can move forward and where the gaps exist and how do they mine the gap and close the gap. Um, but if they don't know and if there's just a sense, oh, maybe these countries are for and these are against, and you have to measure progress. And the only way to measure progress is by knowing where people stand, what they stand for, what they're against, and how do we bridge the gap. Just a few more questions for you, Prime Minister, with a more national-specific slant. You saw the political declaration adopted in the General Assembly to mark the 20th anniversary of the Durban Declaration and Programme of Action to Combat Racism and All Its Intolerances. Uh, the theme for this year's meeting was reparations, racial justice and equality for people of African descent, a meeting uh, boycotted by many Western nations over what they view as the unfair targeting of Israel. 
Does the issue of reparations have enough currency for this process to move forward at the United Nations in a tangible way? I think it will continue and it will have. I mean, once again, this is an example where the people of the world have stood up and said to their governments, hey, what were you doing? You're playing the fool. And, and, and in a very real sense, George Floyd's death um, was horrific. And, but George Floyd's death has sparked a global movement among ordinary people who said, look, we don't like this kind of unfair treatment. And by the way, as we're talking about unfair treatment and treatment that leads people um, to the loss of their lives, let's also talk about what happened in the past. And we can't forget the fact that when many of these countries became independent, the same ones that were not existing in 1945 when the UN Charter was signed, when these countries became independent, nobody left a development compact there for them to meet the urgent needs of housing or to meet the urgent needs of education and health care. And why is that an issue? Because for centuries there was an extraction of wealth. I saw the comments recently from the British government with respect to the Benin bronze, bronzes in, in the British Museum. It is unheard of that you could believe that you could keep property that is not your own. And, and when we look at the situation with Haiti, where Haiti paid after its independence, its declaration of independence after the war that it fought, it had to pay France for over a hundred years portions of its customs duties. And we can go through Africa and we can go through the Caribbean and we can go through the Pacific and find a whole host of measures that literally undermined our country's ability to be able to get off the ground at the time of independence in a way that our people expected us to be able to do and to meet their natural and legitimate concerns that we now call the SDGs, but that are basic, basic, basic to your right to live and your right to freedom. But just look how difficult it is to capacitate the $100 billion Green Climate Fund, right? And, and that will benefit everybody, essentially. Reparations won't necessarily benefit the, you know, the, the colonial masters uh, that, that are perhaps uh, uh, most responsible for making those payments. That's why it's not an easy battle. But by the same token, you have universities like the University of Glasgow come together with the University of the West Indies to put together a special compact led ably by Sir Hilary Beckles, who is the chair of our Reparations Commission in CARICOM. He's the vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies. And he has been able to get movement from a number of entities, some private, some university, and will continue the battle. But as you know, great causes are not won overnight. Speaking of great causes, the equality of women, let me ask you this. You are the first female leader uh, of government in Barbados, one of just 26 women serving as heads of state or government as of the 1st of September 2021. And that's about to even be reduced further with changes in leadership in Germany, in Norway and in Estonia, Prime Minister. How has patriarchy confronted your leadership and how have you responded to it? Well, my journey hasn't been an easy one, as most women who have reached um, leadership have not had an easy one. But I don't want to focus on me or the single leader at the top. As I've made the point, we need to focus on where do we carry women. And, and certainly when people ask me about being the first, I, I make the point that I really want to make sure that I'm not the last. And that's where the thrust of our efforts has to be. Um, we've seen, for example, in the pandemic, um, we managed in our own country to be able to get female unemployment lower than male unemployment down to the end of 2020, 2019. An amazing achievement. With the pandemic, female unemployment has literally almost doubled to go ahead of male unemployment again. Um, and why? Because in very real sense, a lot of the female employment is tenuous. We're not sufficiently taking account of the care economy. Um, I do feel that if you had to pay for a lot of the services that women render in households, we would have to pay a lot more than we're paying. And we're trying to change how we deliver services, even here, because we recognize that services delivered in homes and communities can be perhaps more effective than services delivered in institutional frameworks where you need a board of management, where you need these levels of uh, maintenance managers, etc., etc., and all of a sudden your prices per capita cost of treating people goes up high. So I think that if we can reach girls and women and provide them with the level of training and education and give them the opportunity to be able to have structured and formal 
formal payment within the care economy, while at the same time recognizing that women in other areas of the economic activity um, need to be given the opportunity without the disparity in pay and without the disparity in opportunity, then I would feel far better than knowing that we had 20 or 30 or 40 women leaders across the world. Final area I want to touch on, uh, Prime Minister, you uh, are also on track to use your overwhelming parliamentary majority to oversee Barbados's move towards a republic by the end of November this year, ousting the British Queen as heads of, head of state after more than 50, uh, de five decades, excuse me. What do you believe this moment signifies not only to Barbadians, uh, but to the rest of the world? Well, to begin with, we're not ousting her, we're just saying goodbye. We feel that a Barbadian should be a Barbadian head of state. And we understand the difference. Look, when we were settled in our modern settlement in 1625, 396 years, we've had a British monarch as head of state of Barbados since then. We believe that we can manage fully all of our affairs and that having taken the step to independence in 1966, before we turn 55 this year, that we need to close the gap and give our people the sense and confidence, that little boy and that little girl, that you can be the president of your own country in the same way that in South Africa you have a South African who can rise to be president of their own country. But if you give people the belief that someone can be your head of state purely by circumstances of birth and, and that have nothing at all to do with meritocracy or their ability to have that dedicated relationship to your own country, then I believe we undermine the confidence and the self-esteem of our people. We hope that this one will remove the difficulties that we have because there are some powers that are exercised by the palace that need to be exercised by the president, um, the appointment of ambassadors, the appointment of some honors and a few others. But secondly, we want to be able to give our people that sense of confidence that you can be the best that you can be and that you can as aspire to anything in the world. But you are not condemned to being an inferior citizen simply because of the circumstances of your birth and the reality that we carry on a hangover from a previous time of a person who was a colonizer previously being the person who remains as your head of state. And, 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 and I want to say that we have absolute respect for Her Majesty. In fact, I think she is one of the iconic leaders of the 20th century and early 21st century. But having said that, we want to be able to relate on it on the basis of making sure that our people do not pay a price for her being our head of state. And that price is regrettably that sense of confidence that they may not have in themselves that they should have. Prime Minister, maybe once you reach the age of 95, we'll also be referring to you as one of the iconic leaders of the 21st century. Thank you so very much indeed for making time to speak with us. We certainly appreciate it.